you're female, 45 plus, and keen to grasp the opportunity midlife brings, this is for you. If you love someone who fits that description, this is for you too. I'm Jo Blackwell, and this podcast is part of my business, The Midlife Movement. Our aim is to help women step into a starring role in their own lives, whatever that means to you. Hi everybody, it's Jo Blackwell here from The Midlife Movement, and I'm here today with Canadian Elle Chenier. Hi Elle. Hi, nice to be here. Thank you for coming. Um, now, Elle is a professor of history at Simon Fraser University and is the founder of Gender Mentors, which is a community of support for non-binary people. That's yeah. right, yes. So can we start with a, a definition of what non-binary means, please? Absolutely. So non-binary can mean many, many different things, but basically on the most basic level, Someone who says they're non-binary, they either identify as both male and female. So they feel, or they have a felt, I like to talk about it as a felt sense. They have a felt sense of being both. Uh, and then there's this whole language that's evolving from that. So like demi-girl, which means sometimes I really feel like a girl, but sometimes I don't. So I'm a non-binary demi-girl. So you get all these wonderful combinations. Um, but other people like myself identify as neither male nor female. Um, and so I'll just tell you, I like to talk about it as a felt sense because and here's where I'll tell you a little bit about my own backstory. I never felt male or female. I just never felt it. But also though, so, so some people experience what's called uh, dysphoria where, um, and this can be trans people or non-binary people, where they feel a, a, a real profound uh, discomfort with aspects of their physical body. And sometimes dysphoria is provoked by uh, biological processes like uh, menstruation or menopause, um, uh, things that happen with the male body that I'm less familiar with. <laughs> so aspects of your physical, the physical manifestation, which we associate, our culture associates with specific genders can cause dysphoria. But for myself, I didn't have any sense of dysphoria. So later in life, I, and I didn't have a preference for boy things or girl things, like definitely there were boy things that I was interested in. I can't really think of girl things that I was interested in, but when I was a kid growing up in the seventies, you know, a lot of stuff we did weren't gendered. Like I liked reading and I liked drawing in color books. Like those weren't gendered activities, right? Everybody just did that, that kind of stuff, playing with building blocks and all those kinds of things. So I didn't really think anything of it. And then when I uh, got into my twenties and I was in university and discovered feminist theory, I was like, yeah, I'm a feminist. Feminists are critical of gender as an oppressive system in which men have to fix and fit into their box and women have to fit in their box and the whole thing serves patriarchy and it limits women and I'm like, yeah, so all of that made sense to me. And then at the same time as that was happening, I was starting to explore my sexuality. So I had always been attracted to women, but any of you who grew up in the 80s with access to Penthouse magazine knew there was tons of porn that completely normalized women having sex with women. So I never really thought about it as identity. I thought about it as sexual desire. And it seemed like it was pretty normal for a woman to want to have sex with another woman. So again, none of what was happening with me felt like abnormal or strange. It's not that I felt like I... I didn't really fit in, but I never felt like I fit in either. But what teenager feels like they fit in, right? right. So for me, like there wasn't, yeah. So I like, so I went on to become an oral historian and I interviewed tons of queer people through the course of my life. I've interviewed hundreds of queer people. And I know that many of them, and this is true for trans people too, many of them from a very young age have a very profound sense of something being wrong. They have a very profound sense that they're different. That's their truth. I'm just saying for me, I wasn't disturbed by my body. I was disturbed by patriarchy. I was disturbed by injustice. Um, so for me, for years, 30 years, in fact, 
being a lesbian and being a feminist was a perfect fit. Um, it was a place, it was a community where you could present more femme, more butch, um, and I went both ways. I went all ways. Um, I go from having long hair to having short hair all the time because I love growing my hair and I love cutting it off. I just love all of that. So I enjoy makeup. At one point in, when I was a teenager, I thought about becoming a cosmetologist. Um, and I love being a professor of history. So all of those things. Anyhow, you know, people are inventing themselves all the time. And a lot of times there just aren't words to describe things that we feel. We don't have words. I, I happen to think that it's possible the English language in particular is really impoverished. I don't know. <laughs> but um, in yeah. any case, when uh, non-binary became more common and my students started using the term, one day last, so this was January, 2020, uh, I asked my students to, if they wanted to say what their pronouns were, please go ahead and say. And so one of my students said they, them. So I always like to try and normalize things like that. And I always like to do the heavy lifting for the students. So not ask the student to explain, but I do that work. And, you know, I'm a professor of sexuality and gender. So this is, you know, I was going to say that that's some context, yeah. <laughs> this is my wheelhouse, right? Yeah, I'm very yeah. familiar with all this. Yeah. So I, I turned to students and I said, if you haven't heard of this, they, them as a pronoun before, this is what it means. And basically it's a matter of respect that we respect people, we call them by the names they use and we use the pronouns that they prefer. Yes. And then I said, as I often do, just sort of casually, I said, you know, I mean, if I thought, if I was young, I would come, I would identify as non-binary too. I said, but you know, I'm 52, because that's how old I was a year ago. I'm 52, and I came out 30 years ago, and I'm too tired. I'm not going to come out again. That's it. That's too much work. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, honestly, it didn't, it didn't feel like a pressing, even though I knew it fit for me. Um, there was no, like, need. I, I was very solid in my identity and who I was, and I, I didn't need to articulate it. And then, you know, like two months later, I just woke up one day, honest to goodness, I just woke up one day and I'm like, you're non-binary. And I just thought, okay, that's fine. That is who I am and accepted it. And then I took, decided to sort of take it on and come out really to support young people as a professor. You know, that's so important to me to support young people, what they do. And as someone who's committed to social justice in general, you know, I'm trying to make the world a better place. So I thought, okay, well, I have all this privilege of my position and my age and being a mentor and stuff. So I'll come out publicly uh, to do that. And, and holy smokes, it really unleashed a lot of stuff that I was not expecting at all. I wasn't at all prepared for, for what followed. Hmm? Do you mean externally? Um, that it oh, was, internally, 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 yeah. Ah, interesting. Okay, but just before we go, we go on to yeah. that, if we rewind, then. So, as, yeah. as you were growing up as a child, um, I mean, I grew up in the in the sixties, seventies. So, I was a teenager in the seventies, um, and it wasn't something that was on my radar at all, you know. And and I, I mean, I've had a very straightforward life in, in that way, you know. I've always felt female, known I'm female, and been yeah. quite happy to identify that way. Um, you were saying about it being a felt sensation um, on, you know, whether you're male, female, etc. Um, that must come with an emotional sort of, you know, and you say a felt feeling that it connects to emotion as well, does it? So you have a... I, I just, I don't actually have any emotion around it. That's why, so in, in feminist theory and in queer theory, we talk about gender as being a social construct, right? So that means that... So traditionally, people will say, you know, biologically, you're either male or female, yeah, right? I'm going to say that's what you say to, to that, because because that's what people say, isn't it, all the time? Oh, it, it's quite simple. Biologically, yes. you're either male or female. Yes. And, <laughs> yeah. and that serves a purpose, a function, right? To reproduce, yeah. right? So we're all put on this earth to reproduce. It's all part of the natural order. And you're, you're, you know, you're messing up with that or you're resisting it and, and you're being unnatural, you know, and a sinner and a pervert and, you know, all these other names that, that, that came with it. 
And so what critical, critical scholars of sexuality have shown for decades is that the meanings we attach to masculine and to maleness and to male body and female bodies are far more cultural than they and bio, than they are biological. So two really simple examples I like to give are this. If the whole purpose of humankind is to reproduce, then the most valuable thing that any human could do is get pregnant and make a baby. So obviously this is why women have 10 years of paid maternity leave and we have free crushes everywhere. <laughs> you know and right so yeah. we do the opposite we completely devalue maternity and women in our society so the society is not living up to this supposed you know this mythology we have about what is right and proper yeah the other thing is that the clitoris is the there is no parallel to the clitoris on the male body. There is no parallel. The clitoris is a completely unique organ. And it is the only organ on any body that is purely for the purpose of pleasure. And yet in our culture, it is men who seek sexual pleasure mm. and women who are to be the givers of that, the providers of that sexual pleasure. Really? So once again, it's complete, our bodies say one story and our culture, our society is telling us the exact opposite. I don't think I knew anything about clitorises when I was growing up. I mean, it wasn't no. anywhere near my vocabulary. So yeah, um, no. so you, you, you were supported in your family uh, to be you, you as, as you, whatever you, you identified as, I mean, you know, as a child, you don't identify. Yes necessarily yes. but you didn't have that angst that a lot of people go through you know when they realize that they're gay and you know did you find that you were supported in that do you think that helped I was completely supported uh in my family but that being said and I don't know that this would have changed anything but you know I was not like a committed tomboy as a kid so um I I didn't have experiences that some other people would have had. I didn't come out until I was 20 or 21, maybe 21. So, um, yeah, but there's a, listen, my family is a whole, there's a whole other story about my, my family is very, very accepting. And when I came out to my mom, she told me that my dad, who died when I was 10 years old, she told me that my dad was bisexual um, and she had known that. And so, you know, there was this, so she had no like, she, homophobia. Yeah. She had no fear about it. And in fact, her response to me was, well, no wonder your dad was gay because she always saw me as like very much my dad's child. So she was like, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. You're that you're gay because your dad was bi. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was the one who was shocked when I came out to my mom, not her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. Um, I, but there, there's, now, I'm going to show my ignorance here, and we were talking earlier. Um, I think that um, very often we don't talk about these things because we don't understand and we don't want to cause offence yeah. and we don't want to say yeah. the wrong thing or use the wrong pronoun or or whatever. But, I, you know, I would rather say something and it's not right, and then you can tell me that I'm not yeah. right, <laughs> and then I can learn. And I hope that, um, you know, listeners uh, understand where I'm coming from here if I say the wrong things. But what is the correlation? Is there a correlation between non-binary and bisexual oh no no so that's a great question I mean you know for me the the I think it's Walt Whitman who said I contain multitudes you know I, I and and for me that's that's who I am like I just am who I am and and I, I've always um been annoyed by people who say I don't like labels because uh for me, I have uh, under, both as a queer person, but also as a historian of sexuality and social movements, labels are really powerful tools that we can use to help understand ourselves and help um, mobilize for change, right? So by having the label gay, lesbian, queer, trans, non-binary, these labels, we can articulate who we are, we can articulate our experience, and we can, you know, develop services, which is what I'm trying to do with gender mentors is create a space for non-binary people to come together and have these conversations, because we are all 
trying to figure it out. Like, I, I think there's a, for people who don't have these experiences, because the public speakers have already figured it out by the time they become public speakers, I think there's this idea that people who know, know, and it's very certain. And so there's all these people who are just questioning and they just feel like, oh, I, can I call myself non-binary? Am I trans? Like, is that legit? Can I really claim that? And so, but yes, you can. Like, if you're asking those questions and I encourage everybody, even if you are what we call cisgender. So if you're born so in a female me. body, I'm, I'm cisgender. Yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> but it's always good, you know, as a feminist, it's always good to be questioning yeah. what does gender mean, you know, because there's ways in which it can be really empowering and there's ways in which it can be really limiting. And so I, this is where there's an alignment with, with, with your community is that we're looking to look at ourselves and say, what are the limitations or the limiting beliefs that we've absorbed willfully or not, but consciously or unconsciously, what are the limiting beliefs that we've absorbed that might be, this might be a good moment in our lives where we have a little space, we can relax and look at it and go, well, is that really true? Is, is that really me? Is that really how I feel about myself? And maybe the answer will be yes. Yes, it is. But maybe it will be eh, not so much, right? And so, so these are the biggest limiting beliefs we have are around gender. And of course, this applies to, to, to men and women, but it just tends to advantage men and it tends to disadvantage women. But in both respects, you know, it, it's, 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 those limiting beliefs are really harmful to all of us. So what, one of the things I'm always trying to say to, to bolster my community is we have a superpower. You know, I realize that that figuring out who we are can be a very painful process, but we're doing the work of really reflecting on what does all this mean? Whereas most people, they never really have cause to. So they just kind of float through life, never really questioning like all those ideas about what it is to be a good girl, you know? <laughs> like how many of them am I still operating by that maybe it's time to let go of that? I was, um, my, my father said to me when I was a, quite a young teen, um, Joe, you're really clever. You need to hide that. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I, I got married at, um, I was a month after my 20th birthday. Um, I've been married nearly 40 years. <laughs> and my dad said to me, um, before he walked me down the aisle, now Joe, he said, you're always right. I know that, you know that. But if you want to stay happily married, you need to pretend sometimes that you're not. <laughs> now I've been married 40 years, so you can, you can draw what you like from that. <laughs> but, it, but it had the effect of, I, re I remember, um, you know, I was brought up by my grandmother until my stepmother came into my life. And I remember her saying, I was crawling all over a, a broadsheet because I knew that those squiggles were words. And I loved, I wanted to know what they said, you know. Oh, I hope she's not going to be a blue stocking. Now, mm -hmm. have you heard that term? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, for anybody listening, that's, um, I think it was in Cambridge, wasn't it? The, the yes. university students that were female wore blue stockings. Uh, that was a shameful thing. So I knew from a very young age that uh, my, my curiosity, the fact that I wasted so much time reading, <laughs> etc., was not acceptable. So even sort of for a fairly straightforward identity of being female, there are so many constrictions put on you. So from that, just from that tiny experience of mine, I can understand that sort of looking at expectations and, and, and where we fit in society. When you talk about labels, um, I mean, I think it's really important. You, you, you've, there are so many labels, and I think that the cisgender community are really confused because okay. we started off with LG. T, I think it was. Yeah. Well, it was LGBT, yeah. and yeah. then LGBTQ, and I saw one the other day. It was about this long, you know. Yeah. Like, I haven't got a clue what any of those mean. Yeah. And it's almost like, oh no, not another one. I thought I knew where I was. <laughs> it's interesting though that I want to know where I am. I want to know. Oh, okay, so this is happening now, and I want to know. Well, how do you fit there? And I'm putting 
you know, I'm putting externally people into those onto those labels so that I yeah. can make sense of the world, world, aren't I? So this this gets into now we're now we're really in my wheelhouse here, right? With, with yeah. issues around sexuality and morality, which of course over completely overlap with gender, and and it also needs to be said they overlap with with race, right? So the ideal type, you know, is the white middle class. Uh, heterosexual right and so much of when you say the ideal type sorry to interrupt but when you say the ideal type do you mean that's what is it decided to be normal yes exactly that that word is used for yeah exactly exactly like the ideal social type in society right who is also a stand-in for normal right yeah and um and this this is not just like theory i mean if we look at how medications are tested you know they tend to be tested principally on white men uh, and no other groups we don't know how actually they interact with women or women are a subgroup right that get tested subsequently right we um, race with them um, with covid haven't we as well you know the differences that you know yes yeah. exactly exactly and, and there's been a, thankfully a lot of talk about the differential impact of covid on people according to not just gender but race and class which of course all of these categories intersect with class as well right so so yeah so so it's not just a theory um it's not just an image but these images actually have real real impacts um in in the world that we live in that are that are really that are felt uh by people on an intimate level in any case so sexuality is a realm which is shrouded in a lot of shame and so what happened is in terms of like the history of movements is lesbians and gays contested the sh- the idea that talking about sex was shameful and so did feminists so they normalized in the 70s and 80s you see the normalization of talking about masturbation right which was a huge taboo that we should ever talk about it and so making sex outside of marriage like you couldn't talk about sex outside of marriage right like i remember when you know, in the 60s, well, I don't remember it as my life, but as a historian, in the 60s, you know, the first women who could get birth control were married women, right? Your doctor could deny you birth control because you weren't married. So all of these things were, it's because of this norm that was taboo. So feminists, the combination of feminists and lesbian gay people challenged all of these taboos. And so they made talking about sex, um, uh, not just normal and natural, but necessary and then of course the AIDS crisis pushed that much much further because we had to talk about safe sex and that prompted all kinds of debates about should condoms be accessible to teenagers you know and and they had these debates during world war one by the way more men I think died from the effects of uh, venereal diseases than they died from um, actual war and again, but they would not provide condoms because condoms, you know, said it was okay to have illicit sex. So this debate about sexual morality, it first of all, it's been killing people for years, right? Like literally killing people, not just queer people, not just trans people, but straight people because they were being denied access to condoms, right? And I remember asking my grandmother about this, who would have been born in the 1910s, I guess. And she said, oh, yeah, like condoms, only prostitutes use those. Like I would never, she would never have allowed her husband to use a condom with her, right? That was only, it meant you were a prostitute if you were using a condom. So that's how, again, we go back to the cultural meanings of things that have a scientific purpose, right? Anyhow, so as gay and lesbian normalize and, and, and create this kind of space and a way of talking about uh, sexual difference, then it, it it makes it easier for other folks who are not inside that that heterosexual cisgender ideal norm to articulate who they are and to find community uh, and so on. So LGBTQ, um, so Q is, is queer and represents uh, kind of that word term became popular in the '90s when people thought lesbian and gay was too limiting that their sexuality and their gender was more fluid. So that's when you begin to see the popularization, I wanna say of this notion of gender fluidity um, that you could kind of move between the two. Uh, This was before non-binary was being used. Uh, And then, you know, transgender uh, in the nineties became part of the, in the US anyways, I don't know in the UK, but in the US in the nineties became sort of officially part of the movement. And then I is intersex. So intersex are people who were born that do not conform to the two sex 
to a two sex norm that we assume everybody fits into. And they have some very real political struggles. Mm -hmm. Specifically, surgeons will intervene and advise parents to surgically modify bodies of infants so that they approximate as much as possible a male or female. And as a result, um, those children can grow up with having no sexual sensitivity, lose reproductive function and so on. So their movement was really about not having medical intervention, which still happens today. So they need to be part of the political movement intersex people because their bodies like the bodies of queer and trans people have been subjected to, you know, this kind of normalization regime, if I can use those, those words. Um, so A, so T-I-A is A is asexual. Um, Q, there's another Q, it means questioning. So that's to include everybody who you don't have a label yet, you're not sure which one applies to you, but you're questioning it all. So, okay, <laughs> you get to be in two. And then two, two S, which is very popular here, I don't know about the UK, refers to two spirit. So two spirit is, a, is for indigenous people who um, have their own, let's say cosmology. I'm not quite sure if that's the right world, but, but their own conception of what it means to not be heterosexual. Um, and it's not the same as lesbian and gay. So the two-spirit is a term that indigenous folks came up with themselves. Mm -hmm. And then plus is like, if we haven't thought of you yet, or you're not here, that's <laughs> plus yes. everybody else. So that's, so that's what that alphabet stands for. That's the inclusive bit. Well, thank you so much for that because I, I Google so much. <laughs> and that's great. I was going to say to you actually, because I had heard that in some cultures, like particularly indigenous cultures, there is this um, understanding of, of gender not necessarily being binary. So, right. you know, it, it's not something new as, um, you know, some people seem to think that it's a, a phase or a fad or a fashion that suddenly, <laughs> you know, people are identifying. Well, as a historian, I can tell you, and this is the, this is, this is real. This is some historical realness right here. What's new is the idea that there are two sexes and that heterosexuality is natural. That is new. Yeah. So it's not even indigenous cultures that had a more expansive understanding of gender and sexuality. Um, other cultures did too. And they're, they're still very much alive. Like you look at India, you look at Thailand, parts of Europe. Um, yes. There are th those, those aspects of those cultures still exist. So the idea that there are only two sexes and that heterosexuality is normal and natural, that actually is what's new. Isn't it interesting? It's it's um it's almost as if so so this idea has has won out in our lifetime, in the same way as as patriarchy has has won out yeah. um, because it was not always <laughs> a man's world, was it? I'm doing a lot of work at, at the moment about women's power and the way that we use power in a different way, um, and, uh, and and looking at sort of coaching women through that kind of transitionary phase during during midlife where we come into our our own sort of power but not in a male way so I think we've lived in that male paradigm for too long and uh, you know the world needs something different so I think that the the, the struggles that you, that you and your community are, are engaging in are part of a whole aren't they and, and a part of yeah. an evolution of, of humanity I suppose um, but um, it, it, it really is interesting. I'd really like to find out more about gender mentors. So um, what was your inspiration for creating that? So, you know, a lot of people talk about that they knew they were, you know, gay or trans or whatever from the time they were born, a very young age. And the only thing I knew from a very young age is I wanted to be a teacher. I remember I had an older sister and she went off to school and I was so lonely. And so I had this little bench and I used to set it up like a little desk and I would play school while she was off at kindergarten and I was crying my tears. And ever since then, I wanted to be a teacher. And so, and I love teaching. I really, really love teaching. And um, uh, yeah, I just enjoy being in community. I enjoy working with people. And so as soon as I learn something, if it's benefited me, I immediately want to teach it. I want to share it. I just want to go like, here, here's this great thing, right? Let me share it with you. When, as I mentioned earlier, um, much to my surprise, and, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna just go a little sideways here and tell this story because I know it relates to the kind of work you're doing with your community. 
So I am, as I've said, I've been out for as a queer person for 30 years. I teach critical sexuality studies. I think I know it all. Like, not know it all, but I think I am a fully realized person, right? I think I am living in my truth. Yeah. And what I want to share with your audience is that when I decided, when I woke up that morning and it's like, you're not binary. I was like, okay, that's fine. No, you know, no biggie. But all this stuff came up for me that I did not realize I had been carrying my whole life and were, I had not processed, I had not dealt with yet. I didn't even know was there. And I have to tell you, that was a shocker. That was a shocker for me because this is, this is what I do. Like, I teach this stuff and to realize that I didn't even know myself fully was it turned it literally turned me inside out it literally turned me inside out and I think that's why this journey for people can be so painful and a lot of people you know and this includes gay and trans people too a lot of people just decide I'm not coming out like just why why go through all that and then have to deal with everybody else's stuff and I'm not even talking about everybody else's stuff. I'm just talking about my own stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So I knew I spent my whole life, obviously, committed to intellectual, you know, critical thinking, right? Writing, critical thinking, research, all that good stuff, which is very empowering. But I knew that to process the stuff that came up for me, which was deeply personal and deeply embodied, right? Because this was about my, my body and how my body was in the world. I knew that I was going to have to use something other than words and concepts. It wasn't going to have to come from my brain. It was going to have to come from my heart. So I reached out to my friends who are artists and I said, what can I do? Like, I got to process this stuff. And so I worked with them and I developed a series of practices to help me explore, to go deeply into myself outside of conceptual frameworks, outside of language, but using more expressive forms. And they, it was, that was what I needed. That was what I did. And um, I mean, it's been extraordinary, like really extraordinary. So as soon as I got, came through the other end of that, I'm like, I got to share this. Yeah. I got to go out there <laughs> and help people like, look, let's use these tools to do this work. And let's, let's, let's come from a place of struggle and pain and trauma to the joy that we all want and deserve, you know? um so and you, by using these creative um yeah. you're accessing your unconscious mind you know rather than your conscious intellectual capacity to really feel those feelings and, and, and find that authenticity within yes yourself. i see I and see. so what's amazing is so now i hold um and the other the other part of it too that i really believe in is coming together as a as a in community and as I say to people, because we have people who come up, show up to our community and some of them love to talk and share and some of them just love to sit quietly and they don't talk. And I always make a point every week of saying, just by being here, you are supporting others in this space. You don't have to talk. If that's, you know, if that's what's comfortable for you, that's fine. And um and I really believe that to be true because we all need to be witnessed in our truth and, and just, and we can all do that. And we don't have to, you know, when you're dealing with the arts and things like that, we don't have to give critical feedback. We just need to witness each other in our truth. And it's the most profound thing. So every week we get together on Sundays, we have two people from the UK who come actually. And, uh, and there's someone from Portugal who comes I and mean, there's people from all over the world who come. And, and we, I give them, a, we do meditation. So I'm a meditation teacher. We do meditation and then I give them a, a prompt and people can either write or, or use whatever creative arts practice they prefer. And we, we work on that for about uh, 15, 20 minutes and people produce the most uh, amazing, beautiful things. But what's important, it, it's not producing the thing, it's the discovery, it's the opening. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is what happens week after week after week in this group is people, it's just simply by taking that moment. I think being in community helps. I think by having someone guide you through it helps because you can, you can relax back into what's happening, right? 
um, and be led, which I think is very sometimes relaxing and <laughs> useful to just be led down that path, be taken there. And then you're, you, 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 create, you, you come into a space where your heart can open. Sometimes just a tiny little crack, sometimes a little bit more, whatever you're ready for is exactly what will happen. And you discover new things about yourself. And I'm telling you, it's uh, the most extraordinary, beautiful thing. It, it's the teaching I had always hoped would happen in my university class, but never quite did. And so now I'm getting to do that um, just outside of the uh, classroom. So it's, it's just wonderful. It sounds wonderful. I mean, all, all the work that I do, whether it's as a photographer or as the, um, the work I do in the midlife movement, is about giving people a voice and, and to, um, helping them find, to helping them to feel seen and heard. Um, and to find that within them so they can see and hear themselves as well and that's exactly yes. what you're doing there isn't it and it is I, I know how powerful that is um, we're, we're often going through a crisis of identity at midlife and I know I know of several women who have come out in their 40s and 50s having yes. sort of gone through you know met all those expectations that were expect. you know they've got married they've had children and then they've gone well, hang on a minute I'm I'm not uh, cisgendered or, or I'm not a heterosexual. Hey, God, yeah. I'm the two might model yeah. again. But yeah. um, I feel safe with you. I feel safe to get it wrong. It's okay. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Yeah. Um, so creating, I mean, that, so creating that community uh, is, is, is a wonderful thing. What I would like to ask you, so mm -hmm. if, if anyone is out there and they are resonating with what you're saying and are just thinking, well, hang on a minute, I can... I, this is is really kind of how I'm feeling what what would be their what would your advice to them be to take that first step to exploring their gender identity mm. well don't just resist uh any desire to shut it down if you feel that maybe not resist so let me see I have to tap now into my 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 Buddhist my Buddhist training right which is we learn to accept everything that's there, even the negative things, right? So what we want to do is we want to notice. So if you feel something, if something arises, we notice. And then if you have resistance to that, we notice. So it's to, it's to be with ourselves without judgment, but loving kindness. And so, so if something comes up like, oh, that's painful, I don't like that, um, then to approach it with loving kindness. Uh, to acknowledge that it's there. So not try to be something that you aren't, but to show loving kindness to the feelings that arise within you. And of course, um, we need to first make space to allow those feelings to arise. And sometimes um, our minds are so busy, we simply never make space to, uh, for that to happen, which is why an art practice, any art practice is uh, as well as therapy, because therapy is also you know, stopping to sit down with a counselor just to talk about what's on your mind. So you're just taking the time to allow things to arise and to examine them. But uh, and, and while I have a therapist who I love and adore uh, and have worked with for years, um, I also think art practice gives me something additional. That's um, uh, uh, so I always I really encourage that that for folks. It just just like being in nature, like anything you find. Um, restorative is 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 a good and wonderful thing so yeah so for people who have things coming up um i would say just allow give yourself permission to relax into it and know that you'll be okay whatever emerges will be okay and um difficult things will arise like for example and i i, I like to talk about my difficult things because you know not only do I teach critical sexuality studies and I am queer, I was married to a trans person for 14 years. And yet, and yet when I started um, trans doing some ge gender transitioning, so I had top surgery and now I'm taking testosterone. I, one of the things that came up in me was I was afraid people would see, see me as a freak. And then I had to go, oh my gosh, Mm. I see trans people as freaks like that still I had to confront the fact that and of course people in society see trans people as freaks like of course they do but I've learned now to come to a place of non-judgment right uh, as a Buddhist so why do I share that story with you because what I'm saying is you might feel yourself fears arising am I a freak so what I'm saying to you is that's totally normal. Even 
I felt that. And I'm part of this community myself. So this is a very, very normal feeling. It's the world can be very hostile. Mm -hmm. So we only go as, as fast as we want to go. And um, so be kind and patient with yourself, be loving with yourself, but also the best thing in the world always for people who don't fit in whatever in any way is to find your community. And now with the internet, it's so much easier. So today, Sunday, yesterday, during the last get together of my group, we had several new people. And you know, one person said, I'm just so desperate to find non-binary community. And so here they were, you know, thousands of miles away from me, but we could be together in this space. So find that community, reach out and make those connections and just create, create that community if you can't find one. Create it, but take that time. Take the time and be patient with yourself and be and be really loving with yourself. Yeah, and know that it can be painful, but there's also joy. There's also a lot of joy, the joy of letting go. So, so for me, as I mentioned, before, you know, this process turned me inside out and I had to let go of stuff. And that process was really difficult and really, really painful. Um, but being on the other side of it is just like, it's such a huge liberation. So know that the letting go is difficult, the letting go, and this can be anything, right? Letting go of our kids when they leave home, right? And losing our identity as a mother and a caretaker. I have a child and I have a grandchild. Um, the letting go can be very, very painful, right? But when you go through that, you have to examine, like, what did being a mother mean for me? How was that my identity? How did I rely on that to define me? How did it limit me? I'm scared to be alone now. What does that mean? That can be very scary, actually. Um, and so, but once you take the time to be patient and go through those things sort of step by step in a loving, kind way towards yourself, what you find on the other side will be so much more um, joyful for you. Yeah. And if we are we um, talking about motherhood and, and so on, if we have children or grandchildren who are, are questioning them, how can we best support them? Yeah. So when I, uh, so love is always the answer. I mean, it really is. And I, I know that because some people- In the most profound that. way. <laughs> <laughs> it, true, it, it truly is. And um, um, I think that uh, if, if you have concerns or issues, um, take them elsewhere. They're, they're, not con they're not to be discussed with a child, even if they're a teenager. Um, you might be worried, you might be anxious and you might express it as anger or frustration. Um, take it elsewhere, right? what that child needs, no matter how strong they may seem to you, is they need your love and support. Because those of us who aren't within the norm uh, are constantly fearful of being rejected. So even myself, I was on a Zoom meeting with people I'd never met before. None of them were out in any way as queer or anything other than cisgender and heterosexual. And we were talking about what we do and I was sharing what I did and not one person said anything encouraging. And I realized I was very tense because I'm wondering, are they thinking like, oh my God, you know, like, are they religious? And are, are they thinking I need to get out? How did this person end up in our group? I don't wanna be in this group. Like I left just wondering that. And, I, and afterwards I realized all it would take is one person to say, that's so interesting. I'm sure you're gonna have a lot to offer this group or that's so interesting. I'm so glad you're here. Just something like that, that's all, that one thing would have made me feel reassured that I'm welcome there because you just, you, 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 whether you're aware of it or not, you assume you're not welcome. You assume you're making people feel uncomfortable. You assume there may be hostility, rejection and all these things. So you, you have this magical power of being able to make all that go away. Oh, you're so wonderful, I love you. And, and, and that's so exciting for you that you've discovered this and how brave of you to tell me. And I'm so honored that you trusted me um, with this. And, and please tell me, what do you most need right now? Um, and, and, um, and, 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 and please, if I ever get anything wrong, please, please let me know. You know, the, the non-binary people use uh, they, them pronouns and there are many, many more. So it's going to get even more complicated for some people <laughs> like Zizer, for example, yeah. um, Faye, I think is one of them. There are many. And uh, so I, uh, 
when I, um, I have a four-year-old grandchild and I bought two books on gender and non-binary to read to them, storybooks that were appropriate. And uh, I read them to them. And three days later, they announced to their parents, I'm both and neither, meaning I'm both a boy and girl and neither a boy nor girl. And they, they have remained consistent in that identity for, it's been eight months now. So what I, I bring that up because I want to say I constantly misgender them. I constantly uh, don't use that, not constantly, I'm getting better, but I often don't use they when I should be using they. So telling you this to say, <laughs> I am a they, <laughs> obviously my heart is in the right place. It's yeah. hard. So what you have to do is practice. You have to practice in front of the mirror. You have to use they in conversation with other people as often as you can. It's really that simple. It's like we raised all our kids. Practice piano, practice violin. <laughs> the only way you get it is by practicing it. And so that practice is the answer. You'll get it wrong. So the best thing to do in that situation when you do get it wrong is just say, oh, sorry, they. And just correct and keep moving. Just keep moving. Don't turn it into a big deal. Don't make a big fuss about it. Don't go on about what a terrible person you are. <laughs> just say, oh, sorry, my bad, moving on. Right? Yeah, yeah. So we, we can help then by when we're in a meeting and somebody talks to us about these issues by just being welcoming and interested. Um, Absolutely. And, and saying thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. I'm really grateful for this perspective. Any, just any small, like not, don't make a big deal out of it, but something, say something, because then for me, I just go, okay, I'm okay here. I'm accepted here. This is okay for me to be in this room, yeah. you know, um, cause I don't want to be where I'm not welcome. I don't. No, 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 well, none of us do, do we? But it must be something that comes up a lot. And it must be something, as you say, it's in your head that these things are being thought when they might not be. People just don't necessarily know what to say. And are exactly. afraid to say the wrong thing, so they say nothing. And I know I've been guilty of that in the past. Yeah. So this has been really interesting. I feel as if I'm just a little bit further along in my understanding. <laughs> and hopefully, you know, the people listening will um, have a little bit more understanding there. Whilst not wanting to put it on um, other people to explain themselves all the time, understanding is, is key to everything. And, and I think, you know, in general, people do want to be accepting and they do want to understand. So, um, you know, hopefully it'll be, it'll get better as, but across the generations. So thank you so much for coming to talk to us. And, um, and I'll put your details in the podcast notes so that if anybody wants to find out more about gender, gender mentors, then they can contact you if they want to contact you as well. Yes, absolutely. I encourage people to contact me, um, no matter where you're at or what question you have, please reach out. Um, this is my work. This is what I do. I love doing it. So yeah, and it's been a, such a pleasure to talk to you, Joe. I'm really glad you invited me to, to be a part of the midlife movement. Thank you.